<laughs> how do you think you how do you think you uh, uh, met as far as the expectations of what you had originally written your your grant for the so-called disintegration of the caste system? How uh, well, of, uh, it's, it's, see, no, they hadn't heard about the disintegration of the caste system, <laughs> except they worried about me disintegrating the caste system. What happened was the barber uh, who was I, I was so lucky. I got this uh, uh, barber. He was about 60 years old, had about half his teeth, but he was very garrulous, and he wanted to talk about everything to everybody. And he was he. See, the barber's wife. Uh, they're the midwives, and they're the hairdressers, uh, and the barbers, of course, know what's going with the men. And the barbers are the people who carry all the wedding invitations and do the wedding negotiations and all kinds of things like that. So. As, it was an absolute gold mine of information, this barber. And he would know about everything. You know, I'd say, well, what about so and so? Well, this, he's doing this and that, and his daughters and his sons. And, you know, everybody's information was right there. So, great. I thought, lovely, you know, I'll, I'll hire this man. Oh, he was crazy to be hired because I was going to pay him cash, you know, not kind. I wasn't, they did a lot of barter. But um, I didn't have anything else to barter, but plenty of money. So uh, he was he really eager to do this. And I signed him up right away. He was going to wash my, didn't, my dishes. Well, my dishes consisted of two metal plates. That was about it. <laughs> and he was going to bring water and put it in my tank. And, uh, and uh, there was no running water, of course, but I had a sort of big container for water with a spigot on it. Uh, well, the next day he came to me and he said, sorry, I've got to quit. I can't work for you. Why not? Because my Brahmin patrons would be polluted by you. If he washes my dishes, he would be polluted. Now, now that had great implications because most of his, his best customers were Brahmins. And not only that, but he had a daughter to marry, another another being another, and she couldn't marry anybody because he would be, she would be, so that everything depended on that. And the, and the Brahmins were very, the Brahmins were very upset with me because I was going to destroy their service system, invalidate their and the whole caste of barbers, and there were it was a. The reason why it was a bigger village and it had 1,100 people in it, it was about 850 then. Uh, but it, it, one reason why it had 24 cows in it, because they were serving all the surrounding little villages around. And the barbers, the whole lot of barbers, they, they were serving 10 other villages. So th this would be a terrible, you know, this is the jug van, you might say, that I, I was threatening by, by asking this man to wash my dishes. So, then I began, you know, follow this out, and, and there was a, a very great, very hostile reaction by, by the Brahmins, and they they thought, of course, that I would eat meat and throw bones around and and you know generally disrupt uh, things and, and sit with the untouchables in, in the village and, uh, and you know and, and threaten and then of course rumors, oh my goodness, so many rumors they had about me that terrible things that I'd done, and I would hear this through my interpreter or through, through the barber. I, I kept the barber around anyway. I didn't make him wash the dishes, but he was, you know, was, he was a very welcome visitor to my house whenever I could get him in. He loved to come and, and hang around anyhow. So, but the rumors were terrific. Well, it just happened that in another village 10 miles away, a, another anthropologist had arrived. And this was um, a woman named Gittel Steed, uh, Gittel Poznanski Steed, who had come from Columbia University. The Columbia University uh, program in, um, in, in other cultures uh, had been financed by the Office of Naval Research, and, and again, part of the war morale business. Uh, and she had been intending to work in China has had my professor, Robert Redfield, here. Uh, in fact, he was in China, and, and then the communists took over. He was in a village not far from Beijing. But uh, he was thrown out by the communists, asked to leave. 
And, uh, and so she, from Colombia, that project, which was also going to be in China, uh, was terminated. But the Colombian people said, we got all this money and the Office of Naval Research doesn't ask for it back, so how about we, we go to India instead? Well, so they'd gone to India on a moment's notice and they'd been working in Gujarat for, for a year. Uh, but then they moved over. She, that, they worked on a um, Hindu village in Gujarat, in Western India, and then uh, they wanted to do a Muslim village, and they chose an Aligarh district. This is entirely, in, I had no idea they were coming, but they, people said, well, there's another anthropologist here. So, so I heard, you know, and that was, that was Gil Steen, and she came with a fairly large party of uh, uh, assistants. Now, where were we? Well, I. One question is how you ended up navigating the matrix of all of these uh, cast dynamics. Well, I, I did all the usual anthropological things. That is, I tried to, to get acquainted with every family in the village. Uh, I did genealogies, get the names of everybody. Of course, I got a lot of false names and, uh, and, and crazy information, the way Gore, Jeffrey Gore said I would. <laughs> you know, people were, you were friendly, of course. Uh, but they had rumors. They thought I, you know, I was going to take all the children and put them in orphanages the way the missionaries had done during famines. They had these stories, you know, about about the way these foreigners act. They'd never seen an American before. They, most of them had never seen any European person before, as a matter of fact, in that village because it was way out in the sticks. And <coughs> chose a place that was as far as possible from uh, any lines of regular lines of communication so that it would have all the you know, more conservative features, and it certainly did. Um, but they were worried, and, and uh, my uh, colleague, Gittel Steed, over there, uh, she was relatively naive. She didn't have any Indian language at all. And, uh, but but she, had, she was a psych psychologist. She'd done a lot of work with Margaret Mead. She was Margaret Mead, and, and uh, Morris Carstairs was on her staff initially in, in Gujarat, the uh, psychoanalyst doctor, uh, medical doctor who had been come under Margaret Mead's aegis in, in, in when he was posted in New York uh, during the war. But anyhow, uh, Carstairs, well, she as a, uh, where was I, uh, complicated story. Uh, I, yeah, so I, the rumors, that was, the, she was, she solved the rumor pro, pro, problem for me because she had had rumors and they had developed a technique in Gujarat for collecting rumors about themselves. And so they would collect the rumors and read them back to the villagers every night when they had a new collection of rumors. And of course, People who were near nearby, their neighbors and so on, knew these who were false rumors in many cases, and, and they would be used by these rumors, and that's what I did, and it worked wonderfully. And we had a lovely time. We had sort of evening parties re reading rumors about ourselves, you know, <laughs> and of course the villagers were pretty good at making up rumors, and, uh, and uh, <laughs> you know, I'd cut off the breast of a barber woman in order to get this house, and I, you know, I was gonna take over all the fields and uh, uh, start up a collective farm, or I was going to uh, build a skyscraper. They, the only idea they had, you see, in the, uh, many of the people I had was from these little peep shows, the little thing that uh, go around the village, you know, and they had pictures of New York skyscrapers and things like that. And so they figured, yeah, I was going to build a skyscraper. You know, that's how the Americans get these tremendous yields from their fields by making one on top of the other, so they were going to, anyway, I was going to take you know, all these crazy things I was going to do. Huh. Huh. Dangerous guy. Now, there, there was a, right at that time, if I'm not mistaken, there was a rich cohort of people who were beginning to study South Asia at that time, around the time that you began also. Yes, so there, others, others came in, yes. Morris Carstairs, uh, not Morris Carstairs, Morris Oppler from mm -hmm. um, Cornell, uh, had set up a program in, in East uh, UP uh, and then uh, set up another one in West. Uh, but apparently he didn't get on very well with the Lucknow people. And they, and they were, he had these two stations in Uttar Pradesh and he offended them somehow and they felt some rivalry and ultimately made it very unpleasant for him. Uh, so he had, had to leave. 
but he had some students, and some of his students got into trouble. He had sort of a team, they built a big bungalow in one of these villages, uh, which uh, then housed um, the field workers. I think that was a mistake. They weren't living the life of the people. They weren't doing participant observation, really. And they were much more focused. They went in and they're going to study uh, this or that particular topic. And they were relatively narrow people. I was in a small community trying to do everything. I, well, I, my idea was holistic research. Well, ultimately, I did. So, tried various social psychological questionnaires and things like that that were, that were focused, but they were focused as part of uh, the whole thing. I asked, asked people to describe each other. And uh, so I was interested in the terms they used for the descriptions. And, and I generally asked open-ended questions. I used TATs and, and picture stories and so on. I, I didn't find those things very useful, though, really, because people were so full of stories anyway uh, that I didn't really need to show them pictures to get them to talk. They're very talkative people. They're very talkative. So that part was easy. And then you, you said that you were studying with Robert Redfield. He was your, he became your graduate advisor. Well, he, did, he, he wasn't ever, no, actually. Huh. But um, I, he was, of course, cooking up big designs for India. And he, and he wanted to study the whole, civil, he wanted to study civilizations. And, and, uh, he'd been uh, an ambulance driver in World War I in France, and uh, was, he was a pacifist, and he was just so sick of war. And he wanted to do anything with the new United Nations being formed that would promote mutual understanding among nations. And that was his major motivation in starting this. And they got this big Ford Foundation grant. He, with Milton Singer, philosopher turned anthropologist here, they were just taking over. Milton hadn't come to the department while I was there in training. Uh, but Redfield was there just as I was coming back. And But, but in fact, before I'd come back, he was writing me letters. And uh, I, I had gone to some of these seminars. I, I'd never taken a course with him, actually. And he was not my advisor, but he was my guru in another sense. And I uh, was was very impressed with him. I liked him a lot. And, uh, I was a teaching assistant uh, mm -hmm. for him, uh, I think, a year before I went. And I felt very, very happy with him mm -hmm. as an intellectual inspirer. And he then began asking big questions, you know, about the civilization as a whole. And so uh, I, I, he was interested in, in he and Milton develop this idea of the great little traditions, which I didn't think was a good idea at all, but nevertheless it was clear that, that I could answer a lot of questions about that. Uh, that is, the different, the, he, you know, we had these Sanskrit, the Sanskrit level, you know, somehow or other, and then Srinivas, uh, leading Indian sociologist, had been very cordial to me also. Uh, Srinivas was, had just taken over the professorship in, in Baroda, sociology department at the University of Baroda. And when I came to India, and I, I called on him. And he was very, very welcoming and uh, very eager to have other anthropologists working for him and to do this sort of holistic work. Well, then they, Srinivas and Singer got together. Singer was then working in India for uh, most of the year, I think. Uh, so they got acquainted. And that brought me together with the whole question of, you know, the, and brought Singer into the great little uh, issue. While I didn't like, I didn't think, I liked the idea of, of doing the whole, that holism idea was terribly important to me. Do the whole civilization, to see, always see everything in the largest possible context. You know, the start world view, everything. Let's, let's really get cosmology from the villager up. And, and whatever the social relations are that connect the higher and the lower levels and so on. Well, I can see lots of evidence for that going on in the village. Oh, so much going on. So I was just, I could supply Redfield with anything he wanted, you know, in the way of leads and information and, and suggestions. So uh, we had a very cordial relationship. It's interesting that idea, that idea of studying a civilization instead of a village inside of a culture. You, you published a paper quite a bit later about yeah. ethnosociology. 
Uh, oh yes, that seemed to speak to that. Yes, that, that was certainly that was certainly a Redfield idea. That, that he he uh, when I was working with him as a, as a, an assistant, reading papers and things like that. He's he, anything that was that he said. Well, this is just routine social science. That was you know that it would just take American social science and, and apply it, or you know use Weber or Marx or whatever you want, but. Uh, to do it without asking their ideas was a big mistake. So the, the idea of working with indigenous logics, indigenous categories, was fundamental. And I kept that in the back of my mind. I, d I did a lot of uh, statistical research at first that was pure American social science, I think, at the beginning. Lots of observations. I had thousands of little slips of particular observations of who's talking to who. See, I tried to identify, identify everybody in the village. And then I record, I would just wander around the village every day, the usual anthropological thing, try to cover the whole picture, you see. Meet everybody, don't, don't just get one informant. Everybody's your informant. And, but I wrote down everything that I saw, all in all. Very, very picky business. And then I added them all up, see. And I could see, it was one of the amazing things I saw right away was that People of different caste were friends. My God, you know, according to the literature, <laughs> they were. They never talked to each other. They never ate. They never did anything together. That wasn't the case at all. There were a thousand people, and they were all doing the. You know, they were all related to each other in special ways. But I had to then see that it wasn't, it wasn't just A and B talking, but it was A talking first and B talking second, or A's. Uh, sitting down and be standing up, and you know all the little uh, niceties of social relations. I had to learn all of that. All this thousands of little slips were useless. So God, the statistical approach, I had to learn their ways of counting things. So I'd ask, "What did you see today?" You know, and get their ideas. I did a lot of that kind of mm -hmm. stuff, mostly just listening, mm -hmm. not asking a whole lot of questions. I did try to do everything. Normal, you know, you would do in the way of getting a census and uh, land records and uh, all that kind of thing. Now you went back. You went back for an extended period of research. Yes, a few years later. A few years later, right? Yeah, and and what was uh, what brought you back? And was it in this? Well, it was the Green Revolution that brought me back. Oh. Uh, uh, I it was uh, 19 years after my first day. I stayed in the village the first more than a year, mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, then I, the, when I came back, I was quite focused, and I had by then worked up all the basic um, facts about the village, you know, and the old people, everybody was on a slip, and I had boxes and boxes of, of detailed information about the, the physical situation and, and everything else, really. Uh, but then I could see the, the tremendous changes going on. They'd gotten electricity. I, I actually helped bring the electricity in myself. Uh, I'm almost sorry for it, but I, you know, because it, I, I like the old peasant culture an awful lot, and it was very, very interesting and so different. But I brought in uh, the electricity that helped light the houses. They had, they were getting some for uh, wells, and for pumps on electric pumps on wells. Uh, but but there was so much going on. They were having uh, the first national election the year the. Time I was there, uh, in the first the first time rather that was this was then another election camp had come along at this at this point so I was in a, seeing the second complete election at the village level, village politics and office, and new laws had come in and there were there were um, uh, in the uh, first in the first you see the first time I was there they were doing land reform so they had they were giving um, bonds. Uh, to the farmers who had to pay ten times their rent uh, in order to become owners. That is, the, the farmers, most of the farmers, almost all the farmers were tenants under the old tenancy system. The new tenancy system made them owners, uh, and they were paying directly to the government. They wiped out the landlord class that was in the middle. Well, the landlord was being abolished. That was another. Landlordism was being abolished. So, I'd, I'd known a lot of the landlords, and so it was a wonderfully tumultuous time. Uh, things happening, and that in, in that in that year also my house was robbed, mm -hmm. and that 
had turned out to be very fascinating because uh, the village had to go into action to try to solve my uh, my crime, and that, of course they were they were full of hypotheses as to who done it, and uh, that was very interesting. But I, I had planned to do an economic survey in the fields at the time, but everywhere I went in the fields, people would say, "Here, I'll tell you what to do." <laughs> you know? so I, well, but I got you know wonderful uh, field notes, you might say, on on, on crime. And then I uh, went uh, after th after several months, the villagers said, "Well, this is terrible. This is a terrible reputation for our village that we robbed a guest, and uh, you just got to go to the police. We haven't solved the problem." Yet. So I went to the police, and. And they said, don't go to the I mean, initially they said, don't go to the police. They'll just take a lot of bribes and put the wrong person in jail. And so I went to the police, and, and they uh, came in. They said, well, we need your help. It, it was six miles from the police station, and we've got to come in at night. So you bring your Jeep, and, and you carry us into the village. Well, that didn't sound like the role I wanted, uh, you know, as an anthropologist turned out to be a policeman. Uh, so uh, I said, well, okay, I, but you, you mustn't, you mustn't uh, actually make me take the car. I'll stop the car a mile from the village. And, then, um, and they, they said, well, we'll give you a disguise. You can wear a police coat and, and uh, a cap and, and carry a big stick. And so, on. They, and so I did that. And then I, I hung you. We, we went there at uh, 2 a.m. or something like that. And, and tried to round up the usual suspects, and, uh, but I just stood in the shadows. You see, I stayed out, sort of observed this. They they got uh, one scallywag who was a sort of villain joker and uh, uh, he a dopey, a dope seller, and uh, uh, and he, one of my best informants. He was so full of wonderful folklore, but he was one of the guys they put the finger on. Uh, and they tortured him, and he c confessed, in a sense, that is, he, he named the son of the, the landlord as the thief, which, of course, then the police went to the landlord and got a great big bribe, and I learned about this from the village kids, because the kids are all over everything, and most of the people were living outdoors in these courtyards that had no roofs, their houses really were just had sort of closets for storing, storing grain or something that they were getting out of the rain, but otherwise they were uh, audible. And the kids were going over the walls all the time listening to the gossip. And they'd seen the landlord pay the bribe, and they'd seen where the stolen goods were uh, uh, stowed in the landlord's um, grandmother's chest. And, and anyway, they, they, they gave me the full information. So then I, I, I actually had photographs of all of this, uh, these procedures, and many parts of them. And uh, then I could go to the police and say, you took a bribe and you put the wrong man in jail. And I, I had given them a reward. I had offered a reward for the solution thing just to get things going. I didn't have much longer to stay. Did you? And, and I then asked them to return the reward. So I had the police then. And then I got information from the police about how they operated. And I began to feel a bit worried because they had guns and I didn't. Um, so I, I was glad to be leaving, but I thought I'd, I'd have trouble because I, I put the wrong man in jail. Well, actually, most people were glad to have the wrong man in jail because they didn't think he was the wrong man. He, he was waiting. He needed to be in jail. Well, he ultimately died in jail, and uh, he was not an, he was not a member of an important kin group in the village. Uh, so when I went back 19 years later, I thought, well, that's going to be some trouble for me there. I don't know. Uh, Nobody thought about it at all. In fact, I could then I learned some of his his um, poetic orations, which were very comical and things that I, I'd learned from him. I'd written them all down phonetically, so I could pull out my notes and read these things. You know, a village or something were hilarious. But 
this very, this dead man, this dead thief's orations were uh, delightful. Everybody ever thought that was just fine. When I went back, I then lived in the, the head man's house in the second. They were really cordial to me, entirely different from the first time. And I was immediately brought into the head man's house. I was installed in his living room as my quarters for six months. And everybody wanted to come and see me and tell me all about them and all the things that had happened in the 19 years past. So it was a lovely time. Mm -hmm. Very, very fortunate. Mm -hmm. I have two more. This is this has been so delightful. I, I, I have uh, two more um, questions. One is uh, just a question about your about your cohort, who your most important collaborators and uh, colleagues were as you grew up in, in Indianist anthropology? Well, there were a lot of them. Uh, a great many of them were uh, ones I created in the sense that is, that is students. We had some wonderful, wonderful students. And I was blessed with students. At first, I was doing this routine stuff. Um, doing my statistics and so on. And I had good people who I was wasting the time of, I think, by employing them you know, as, as assistants. Uh, but uh, as time went on, I learned a lot more. And I, uh, my angles changed greatly. I went to the Behavioral Sciences Center for a year at Stanford. And that changed my mind about a lot of things. I was able to learn a lot of math that I hadn't learned in high school. And uh, by then, there was a lot of stuff that wasn't just just ordinary uh, statistics, but it was uh, formal relations. So I I was very impressed. Uh, I was uh, impressed with. Well, I had a man in, in sociology here who later went to Harvard, Harrison White, maybe. Sure. And uh, but he inspired me. He said, "Look here, you can do graph theory and formal relations." Which, which permits you to do just exactly what you wanted to do with cast. And it was really a godsend. It was entirely different. So I learned scaling and other non-parametric stuff and, and graphing. And I, I like to draw pictures and I like that uh, sort of. And I began doing um, three-dimensional graphing. And the three dimensions are, are really, I really uh, uh, went to town with. That's what I'm working on now. But my, my other people in the university who inspired me were uh, not a whole lot. I mean, David Schneider did, uh, but his American kinship uh, stuff I was uh, attracted to uh, because of its uh, beautiful simplicity. Uh, uh, just a two by two square diagram was essence of the whole thing. And I thought, well, that's, that would be very interesting if I could do something as revealing as that, to sort of model Indian civilization in a little two-by-two two diagram. <laughs> but I couldn't do it, and it, it was clear that it didn't work. Well, then uh, I had uh, a couple of students who, I mean, then, of course, the Schneider was affected by Levi Strauss. And um, he wasn't the only one. There. Levi Strauss was very much in fashion. Levi Strauss came here, and uh, but I I read what I read of Levi Strauss didn't work. It, the Indian things were not two by two; they were not dichotomous. They were not they, you couldn't talk about oppositions. You could talk about differences, about um, comparisons. You could do, but you couldn't. They didn't have any um, parametrics to them at all. That's like the Indian things don't maybe most things in the world don't, but. Uh, the Indian ones certainly didn't. In fact, they're philosophically against it. So then, uh, my colleagues here in in um, in uh, Indology were very important. Hans von Biden, for instance, he was an expert in um, not only Mahabharata, uh, Sanskrit in general. He read it like a native, uh, but he also was uh, uh, expert on Sankhya, and Sankhya is the kind of it's, it's the most elemental, the most pervasive, and still the most, the, the best known, and the most, I would say, structuring of, of all, uh, comprehensive in the way that it structures all of Indian life. Uh, it, it deals with the five elements, earth, air, fire, water, 
the ether. And I found, and I'm finding right now, that all of these are really very, very important. And you don't think, well, that's not social science. Very, very far away. But it is, because they build a whole lot of social categories on it. They build qualities of the mind, uh, 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 kinds of human action, kinds of human sensation, uh, uh, everything in politics, um, food, uh, religion, uh, everything is built on this, on this five thing. Well, now it isn't really five dimensions, but it is three dimensions plus space uh, plus uh, uh, place. Location like Earth or something, like that. Uh, or the, the location of anything, the container of anything. Anyway, I, had, I that, have not been working on interpreting these things in the uh, there are five or six different Indian schemes that are all parallel. None of the other, none of the, the Indologists have, have seen that they're all parallel, and uh, so and I'm finding them in peasants, so and in everyday life. So this is a big project and very exciting for me. So I was working with A.K. Ramalaj and then later uh, Van Brighton unfortunately died. And, uh, but he, he took me into the Sankhya, to Ayurveda, which is Indian medicine, Hindu medicine. And, uh, and then I worked with Francis Zimmermann who, in Paris, who, who was, was uh, a student of Dumont. And uh, he uh, was concentrating on Ayurveda. And so those, those are the principal people. The, the, the Indologist, Ramanuj and the poet, dear friend. And we all learned so much from Ramanuj. It was just amazing. He was a poet and a linguist, and very interested in social science, and a folklorist. And he had done all this kind of South Indian folklore. So he was very good in, in pointing out where you know, things were different in South India and all that. But, very imaginative guy. So I just went around to all kinds of meetings with him. And he kept inviting me to India, and, and so we had a, a lovely, lovely time. Those guys, and then my students, and uh, I had some wonderful students. Uh, and I had about, well, I directed about 30, 30 or 40 PhDs, and most of them in India, and uh, a very large part of them, my kind of people, that is that they they wanted to do things in indigenous conceptual systems. And they went, uh, they went right for those issues that they could structure around local concepts and things, local logics, and swept away the, the nonsense. Our big, our big uh, bugaboo was Louis Dumont himself because uh, he'd worked, he had never, he was uh, trained in anthropology, sort of. He actually didn't have a PhD in anthropology. But he he uh, hung around Marcel Mauss, uh, the sociologist, and uh, and got himself a job uh, in in anthropology. Uh, and uh, he, in fact, he he had never done anthropological field work in the usual sense. He'd done some interviewing out of context of members of a South Indian tribe. He never studied the caste system, and then he wrote a book on caste. This was crazy. Uh, uh, but he he um, tried to do a community study in Uttar Pradesh, but he fell ill and he he left after a couple of months. He never did a community study. He'd only studied uprooted tribal informants, and he'd only done their kinship. He knew nothing about rank. He, the first article I ever wrote, I wrote, I published by accident because it was a field report that I'd written uh, for my. Professor Egan actually uh, uh, got hold of it. I wrote, I sent it to Lloyd Warner, and he gave it to Fred Egan. And Fred Egan said, "Well, we're starting up a new magazine about economic development, so why don't we publish this?" He didn't ask me; just published it. And uh, in the first first number, the first issue, first volume of Economic Development, Cultural Change, this journal that was coming out of here, Bert Hoslitz, bless his soul, was the the editor. Nobody asked me. They published it. They had the real name of the village in it. I was trying to do, do it under a pseudonym. So they blew my cover in my very first publication. And this was bad because I wanted to publish all kinds of things that needed a cover uh, about the village, you know, crime and whatever else. Anyhow, uh, it, it got 
we started. <laughs> but, uh, but in that article, especially in the second one, which, which was published with my approval later, under a pseudonym, um, uh, I had used, I focused it all on hierarchy, on the term, which was used in American sociology just to mean up and down relations, you know, just, just asymmetrical relations between people. Uh, but Dumont used the word, he, I had met him coming out of the field. I met him while he was writing up his South Indian kinship stuff at Oxford. I'd stopped by to see him. I, I was fascinated by his, his um, what he picked up from Levi Strauss, I guess, which was the idea that marriage is not about extending the lineage, it's about uh, getting brothers-in-law, you know, about uh, affinal relations. And that was fascinating, and I, I loved the article, the first one of the two articles that he published, uh, in fact, one article, and I, I had gone to Oxford to see him because I admired this article, it was so fresh and interesting, and raised all kinds of questions. I'd done a lot of kinship in the field, so we had fascinating conversation. But he, this idea of hierarchy, I mentioned it, I think, I don't know, 20 times in that first article of mine, and he said, well, that's so surprising, you know. He, he didn't understand about hierarchy. He doesn't even mention hierarchy in any of his, just in his kinship work. He doesn't even see senior and junior as an issue. I mean, it's, it, there's just no, it's all um, an interchange. It's all marriage, and it, there's no dis dissent to speak of. No. I mean, they put in the dissent lines, but he doesn't understand uh, high and low relations, which to me were the most utterly striking and for an American and, and egalitarian, you know, they go and find everything. Every, every relationship is structured high and low somehow. Everything you say and the way you say it and so on. And then he amazed me by making this the topic of his book. He had no field work on it. And most of the people he quoted, there were old reports. He didn't have any students working in the field. He didn't have detailed he picked up some stuff from Adrian Nair. Well, Adrian did very well, but he did not systematize it, and he did not theorize the, the high-low stuff. So it was the only approximation, and basically he's, he just got it wrong, terribly wrong. But he claimed it was all, and then he went back, he insisted it was all French sociology. It was, he was going in at a time of, of De Gaulle, I guess, was in power then. He told me that he had to get a job in Paris he really didn't know anything about North India, but he, he had to get a job there, and he had, as a prisoner of war, he, he learned Sanskrit. Well, in, in, he was captured in Maginot, so he had several years studying in, in prisoner camp uh, Sanskrit. So he knew some Sanskrit, uh, but he didn't know much, and he didn't see any, didn't, hadn't done any Sanskrit in context. So he didn't know any Ayurveda, he didn't know any Sankhya, he didn't know any the real basics. But he was writing it all in terms of Brahmins. He spent this three months in a Brahmin village, in a Brahmin household, really, where he was sick for three months. And that was, he got the Brahmin view, and he published it, and then everybody, you know, it, was, it, it was pure French sociology. The hierarchy that he was talking about was the French Catholic Church. <laughs> and, uh, and he just, he, he, he uses the word, he says, hierarchy is all religious. Well, I didn't look religious at all where I was. It was, it was, you know, ownership, it was power, it was people getting beaten up, it was, uh, you know, it was um, a high and low class, you know, fine, extreme stratification, uh, which people didn't understand that hierarchy, oh, yes, or you could say there was some do with purity and pollution, that's true. But that wasn't the rationale, it wasn't anything, you know, it wasn't. Anyway, that was the big problem. And, but the world wanted to study that because it was so European and everybody went crazy. Oh, not, not everybody, but a lot of people did. And that was all, like, then that really was a big, big problem. Mm -hmm. So my students all had to say, it is not the way the world says. And then they were attacked, attacking Dumont and so on. So we had a lot of waste of time over polemics. Yeah. But that was, but anyhow, the students were great. And I just had one after the other. And, uh, and particularly, uh, it was wonderful. Uh, 
uh, because they would each go and they did really proper field work. They'd all go and they'd stay a year or two and they'd live in the community and they'd do the whole community and, and pick up all kinds of stuff. So I was very pleased with a lot of the results. And many of them were women, and they began working. Uh, this is a time when a lot of women were coming in, into anthropology for, for the first time, and they were doing things that had never been done before, in, in uh, talking about kinship in India and, and families. So I had several wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, sources of information. These people can, uh, then the Social Science Research Council in New York, I went back to, and we had a, a person there named David Zanton who was uh, uh, actually t done a PhD on the Philippines here with Fred Egan. And he'd become the, uh, the, the sort of person who was supposed to deal with uh, most of Asia, I think, uh, at the time at the Social Science Research Council. And he came here and asked us what do we do and uh, what should we do with, if, with India. And Ron Inden and Ralph Nicholas were my students. Oh, well, I, and Ron was actually student in history. Uh, Nicholas was, was my student in anthropology, my second student, I guess, here. They uh, had gotten to work on in Bengali kinship, and they were using indigenous ways of talking about kinship. And it, their book was wonderful, as far as I was concerned. It was really exciting. Uh, and they were working by, alongside me. They were working with Schneider, but they were having a fight with Schneider pretty soon, because Schneider wanted it all to look like his really kinship or something. <laughs> it didn't. <laughs> so uh, 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 Schneider had great difficulty with because he uh, loved to torture people, and he would. Uh, I was very attracted to him and to his ideas. I found him a fascinating guy, uh, but uh, he uh, started a, a cabal against me. And so I had three terrible years as chairman, and while he was trying to uh, besmirch my reputation in every conceivable way, and he had. A, clique of students that were supposed to denounce me in various ways, and it was awful. But uh, nevertheless, <laughs> I had uh, Nicholas and Inden's Bengali book to work with, and that was a great asset. So they and the, and the women students, and then the Social Science Research Council picked up all of this, this whole business of indigenous conceptual systems that they were working with, and by then uh, I really had something going, and they gave me a f five I guess it was six years actually, six years support from Social Science Research Council, so I could run a seminar here uh, with bringing in guests. And instead of doing it all in one big blast, we decided that we had to train people. So we, because the anthropologists had to learn a lot of Indology, and the Indologists we worked with had to learn some anthropology, and they we needed people to go back and forth between the social sciences and the humanities. And it was an ideal situation because we had a growing program here in South Asia. And it was a very happy time. So for, we had visitors coming in and a lot of attendance, and, and they were all writing interesting things. Val Daniel and these other people in Columbia and uh, Sherry Ortner. They were, anyway, they were just a, a great lot of people. Uh, and that, of course, is, is over now. But it was a great boost. That's how we were able to. That's why I was able to get a whole bunch of dissertations done. And each time a di new dissertation would get done, that would come back into the seminar, and the next the next group of students would then. Well, on the way sure. over, Andreas was telling us that, that uh, India says is phenomenally strong here in Chicago. So yeah. clearly, it has. It has. It is. It has been because right now we have very little. It's, it's all totally different, and I think it probably should be. Uh, but it, uh, this, they certainly lost the sense of the whole, as far as I can see. Uh, and nobody's talking about civilization, so that's what I have to do.